Well, welcome and thank you for joining us. We're so glad you're here tonight. If you're just making your way into the group, um, please use the chat box to say hello. We will have everyone muted as you come into the um, into the group, um, but that doesn't mean we don't want you to participate. So please do say hello and let us know where you're tuning in from in the chat box. My name is Laura Nelson. I'm the project leader for the Rancher Stewardship Alliance, and we are just so excited to have you all gathered here tonight. And we're so thrilled to have Dr. Fred Provenza here with us tonight to share his reflections on nourishment. Um, as we have a few more folks making their way into the chat room, I just want to um, let you know who Rancher Stewardship Alliance is and what we do and why we're here. Um, so Rancher Stewardship Alliance is a nonprofit ranch uh, organization led by a group of ranchers in North Central Montana. We started in about 2003 and really our origin story centers around about 30 ranch families who got together in a year of extreme drought and a feeling like there were just a lot of pressures and challenges facing them. And, and this group of ranchers got together and said, gosh, if, if we're gonna survive here, we've got to do more than just survive. We've got to thrive and we've got to work together to create the future for our land, our livestock, our livelihood, our rural community that we imagine. And we've got to work hard to get there. And that, that's, that's what we're still doing today. Um, and a big part of that is education. Um, one of the quotes that really stuck out to me in Fred's book that we're going to talk about tonight was um, something that he told his students. And that's, you know, I don't, um, don't want to tell you what you should think. I don't really care what you think. I just want you to think. And, uh, and, and that's exactly what we're here to do tonight is to just gather together and, and look at some new ideas or some concepts and, and think a little harder and see how we can grow together. So um, our mission statement at Rancher Stewardship Alliance is uh, ranching, conservation, and communities, a winning team. And to us, that means that um, when we all work together, and that's us as ranchers and our partners in the conservation world and our rural communities, that we can all thrive and, and find success together. So that's why we're here tonight. Um, a couple of pieces of housekeeping. Um, we will ask that you stay muted throughout the presentation, but again, we don't want you to think that that means we don't want you to participate. Please do use the chat box, make comments as we go, ask questions as we go. We'll be monitoring that chat box and, and then bring those questions to Fred at the Q&A at the end. Um, I wanna remind you that this will be an interactive event. So um, about half time, we'll take a pause and we'll go into some small group breakout rooms. And, and we do that because we know that often the, the best expert um, in the room is, is the one that's on your ranch, right? So we want you to be able to share with your friends and your neighbors and your peers what you're seeing and experiencing and hearing and have that discussion. Um, so with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Fred Provenza. We're so thrilled to have him here. Um, we were especially excited to have Fred join us tonight because um, we have a Ranch Stewards book club and our book selection for this winter was Fred's book, Nourishment. So we've spent the last five months as a small group um, together discussing and learning and, and sharing together as we work our way through his thoughts and nourishment. So what a thrill and what a joy to have you here with us tonight. Um, so Fred Provenza is Professor Emeritus at, uh, of Behavioral Ecology in the Department of Wildland Resources at Utah State University. At Utah State, um, Fred directed an award-winning research group that pioneered an understanding of how learning influences foraging behavior and how behavior links soils and plants with herbivores and humans. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Fred. Thanks for being with us here tonight. Okay, Laura, can you hear me? We can, you sound good. Okay, good. Well, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. No question about it. Thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Um, Rick contacted me many, many months ago, and then Laura more recently about giving, just trying to give an overview of, of what's in nourishment. Um, 
I wrote the book over about a 10 year period uh, when my wife Sue and I were, were living in the backwoods of Colorado. We were 12 miles in on a graveled road um, away, from, uh, away from civilization actually. The nearest town was about an hour's drive to get out to it. It was just a great time to sit back and reflect on uh, on, a, on, on the years, a uh, lifetime kind of, of, of different activities. My wife and I are from Colorado originally, um, grew up in the mountains of Colorado, worked for many years on a ranch there in Colorado, also studied wildlife biology at Colorado State University. And I, I mention that because those experiences really influenced everything I did and the reflections in the book uh, related to, to those kinds of things, uh, wild and domestic animals, the ranch and so forth are all, all linked to that. So there are, five, there are five sections to the book and I thought about how to just briefly try to touch on what each of those sections is about. And for me, this notion of change and, you know, when I was in college and whether it was undergrad or graduate stu school and talking about plant and animals and populations of those animals, it just struck me that really the, the only constant in this life is change. Mm -hmm. um, the world is constantly changing. Um, and yet, oftentimes we regard change as anomalous, a kind of transitory disruption in a normally constant world. Um, even Albert Einstein was reluctant to accept change when he introduced what's been called the cosmological constant into the general theory of relativity, what that amounted to was a refusal to accept change as the guiding principle structuring the evolution of the universe. And it was, as he later recounted, the greatest blunder he ever made in his career. On a more local scale, and we, we're experiencing this all the time, from the, the wildfires to the floods to droughts now, huge droughts that are occurring, hurricanes, pandemics, changing climates. Um, those are all part and parcel of, of what we experience of this ever-changing uh, climate. <clears throat> On a more local scale, um, you know, when great volcanoes like Mount St. Helens back in the day erupt, covering the earth with layer of volcanic ash for miles around, we often think how strange it is that nature should misbehave so. It is, we might tell ourselves, a momentary lapse, a kind of a geological tantrum. Soon our old planet will regain its composure, its sameness. But the truth is, it's only our short time on Earth that deceives us. Our time here is too short to see continents crash together and tear apart. Mountain ranges rise and fall. Oceans become deserts. Climates warming and cooling, warming and cooling. And plant and herbivore populations coming and going like the ever-changing colors and shapes of a kaleidoscope. Change then isn't the exception to the rule, it's the only rule. Any individual, any social group, any species, if it's going to survive, has got to be able to cope with change. Well, then in the book I talk about, you know, everything from civilizations, which typically last only 250 years or 10 generations before they either go extinct or morph into something else. Um, companies, uh, the, the best run companies in this, this country, the Fortune 500, are less, live less than half our lifetime. And I was reading about S&P 500 companies back in the 20s versus now. I think in the 20s, they lasted 50 years or so. Now they last maybe 15 years. The rate of change is so fast. And species come and go too. You know, the, the quote average lifetime of a species is a few million years before they, they go extinct. And we're told that 99% of the species that have ever been on this planet are, are gone now. So um, change is, is it. What I get into in the book so much, uh, talking a lot about wild and domestic animals, <clears throat> is how do animals cope with an ever-changing environment? What do they do? How do they survive? And uh, I guess a key point without the time or ability to go into a lot of detail that gets into nourishment is that they create relationships with what they deem are the relevant facets of the social and the biophysical worlds they inhabit. 
you know, we, I guess, and maybe in science, I don't know more generally, but we often, I think, kind of machine-like to make animals more into machines. And I think our emphasis on genetics with domestic animals often uh, emphasizes more kind of rigorous machine-like things. But I think what struck me over the years of working with animals and plants and then uh, some of the studies when I got into science is just looking at, at how innovative animals are, the innovative kind of things that they do. And the book has a lot of examples of that. I'm gonna just show you a short video that illustrates that with an oyster catcher here. So you, you may have guessed where that was going to end up. And uh, I think I, I give several examples of these kind of what I would consider to be innovative behaviors by goats and, and sheep and cattle in the book. And then talk about the significance of that. That becomes those kind of behaviors can be then learned by other members of the group and they can become a part of the culture of the group and they can enable animals to better survive in environments uh, where they might not be able to do so well and both give examples with both domestic and wild animals of that throughout the book. So another point that I make in the book and to me it's one of the most important points I think of all is that we often say nature abhors a vacuum. I think nature abhors sameness, nature fills vacuums with individuals, and no two animals have ever been alike on this planet. That's not just uh, hyperbole, that, that is a fact. We know that no two humans are alike, we can be identified by our fingerprints, a bloodhound can track us by our odors, um, and if we look inside at how we're built and how we function and why we eat the foods we do and so forth, that same point is so true. And it's a result of genes interacting with ever-changing environments. And then chance is playing a role. And I talk a little bit about that in the book as well, how that works to, to ensure that no two individuals are ever alike. I also talk a lot about that in the book as relates to how we feed animals. Choice and ability to choose becomes very important and economically it can help to actually save money. When animals are given choices, they can end up eating less food, for instance, in a feedlot environment, or uh, I'll try not to get, I won't get long winded here, but there's just so many implications of how we offer foods to animals and the importance of uh, diversity, plant diversity. Uh, because self-selection enables individuals to more efficiently meet their needs for nutrients and medicines to self-medicate, as we showed in many studies with goat, sheep, and cattle. So that's, that becomes important. The other thing to realize that's related to this genes plus environment plus chance is that epigenetics, this whole field of epigenetics becomes so important. And that's simply the idea that genes are being expressed, turned on, parts of genes are being turned on and shut off as a function of the, of the interaction with the environment. It starts in the womb, in utero, um, and then continues early in life and can continue to some degree throughout life. But these genes are being expressed. And as we were showing in studies, that enable, can enable animals to better survive in environments or on winter forages, winter ranges, 
in ways that they might not otherwise be able to if they, uh, without these epigenetic kind of changes. So to sum up then this notion of ever-changing environments and how to survive, um, you know, we, we should take our views of evolution, I think, beyond how organisms develop from earlier forms or just a, a, a strict focus on genetics when it comes to livestock to include changes that occur within the lifetime of the individual. Individuals are involved in the world, which allows them to evolve with the world and the cultures that they develop uh, as well. So that's, that's a little bit of flavor from the first section. The second section of the, of the book uh, develops those ideas even more as relates to, to this idea that there's a wisdom to the body that every creature on this planet possesses that helps it to know physically. And then at the very end of the book gets into the spiritual part that there's, there's a navigational system that's in every creature that, that knows. It's not this cognitive, rational, analytical thing that we often talk about part of us, but it's much more the non-cognitive, intuitive, synthetic part that's tied into that. And so let's talk a little bit about that as relates to nutrition and the wisdom of the body here. And there are three legs to that stool. Um, and if we break any of those legs, we're not going to see nutritional wisdom manifest. If we break all three legs, then we really end up in a, in a bad situation. And the, a fundamental part of that is this notion of forage diversity or plant diversity. Um, diversity enables individuality. When animals have choice and ability to choose, it allows them to meet needs for nutrients and to self-medicate. Um, then there's this whole social cultural part of things, knowledge that's passed from mother from really we could say from great grandmother to mother to offspring about, la about an environment, what and, <clears throat> what and what not to eat, where and where not to go, what's a predator, what's not a predator, all those things animals are learning. And in cattle, sheep and goats, and you know, even in creatures, uh, I talk about these, these rabbits over in, in uh, in the Netherlands and the amazing ways that they're learning from mother that one might never never think about. So there's this whole social culture part that's in wild and domestic animals as well. And then there's a part that, that <clears throat> at the individual level, this whole notion of flavor feedback. And it's the idea that palatability is more than a matter of taste. It involves feedback and that feedback's coming from cells and organ systems, and it's altering our liking for food. So let me just say a few words briefly about each of those to elaborate. You know, if you think about it, out on a landscape, especially rangelands, you know, there, there'd be hundreds of species, literally, of different plant plants out there. And, you know, herbivores are challenged then to select diets from this diverse array of grass, forbs, shrubs, and trees, that are each really unique. Um, some species and plant parts are nutritious, others are quite, quite toxic. Individual plants can be nutritious or toxic depending on the time of day, uh, the week and the season, and on the resources available in the environment where the plant's growing. There's a paintbrush there in the, that one picture. That paintbrush will change chemically as a function of the amount of moisture, nutrients and sunlight that it gets. So, so just trying to say that there are a lot of challenges that, that animals are, are working through and as we learned, studying them, figuring out, and it's amazing the ways how that their bodies can figure that out. Now, as I go along, I'll talk about that they're figuring out not only the nutrients, these so-called primary compounds like energy, protein, minerals, and so forth, but also this diverse array of so-called secondary compounds that come under broad classes like phenolics, terpenes, and alkaloids. We don't need to get into the details. It's just critical to realize that every plant contains them. They can be toxic or they can promote health. Just depends on how much of the animals eat and the way that animals mix different plants in their diets. Um, <clears throat> 
So here are just some examples of some forbs and grasses and shrubs and, and some of the compounds, the kinds of classes of compounds they, they contain. What's going to be important to realize is that these compounds are influencing selection by animals and animals are very much tuned into the, they don't know their names, but they're very much tuned into all of that in, in amazing ways. So a question that, that we spent, you know, my whole career uh, focused on, and it came from the ranch days where speaking with the old rancher I knew and I talk about him in the book, Henry DeLuca, he talked about Animals knowing the range. What's it mean to know the range? All the work we did is really about what's it mean for an animal to know the range and then how do animals uh, know how to meet their needs for nutrients and medicines? They don't have nutritionists or pharmacists or, or veterinarians. They are all of those things and the body is what guides them. And so to launch into that flavor feedback part just briefly here, if I were to ask you um, why you like a particular food, odds are you tell me because it tastes good. Why don't you like a particular food, you tell me it tastes bad. And you'd be exactly right. But what we came to understand in our work was that our liking for the flavor for, of food is more than a matter of taste. It involves, as I was saying, feedback and that feedback is coming from cells and organ systems, including the microbiome throughout the body. Um, they're feeding, but if you think about why any creature eats, what's it feeding? It's feeding cells. And cells can only forage on what ends, what primary and secondary compounds end up in the capillaries. And feedback is a way through <clears throat> nerves, neurotransmitters, hormones, peptides, whole area. But that's how cells are telling, uh, sending messages to the palate and altering our liking for the flavor of, of foods. And so palatability is more than a matter of taste. I put this book up here, <clears throat> I could spend a lot of time on it. It's titled A Change of Heart by Clear Sylvia. But I just put that there to, to illustrate when people get organ transplants, those organs bring their history with them and they bring the history of the likes of foods that their donors had. And so it's simply showing that at this organ system level, if you get a heart from somebody that liked, in Claire Sylvia's case, that liked to drink beer and liked chicken McNuggets and liked <clears throat> um, green chilies, which she didn't like any of those, once she got that organ put in her body, she came to like all of those. She liked all those things instantly. So this, these, it's simply making that point that cells and organ systems and their relationship with primary and secondary compounds is changing liking for the flavor of food. Now I'm going to show you a short video segment here. And what you'll see is sheep in two pens adjacent to each other. They're eating straw. One group absolutely loves straw. The other group can't figure out why they like it. So they're both having the same taste. They're both, it's in the morning. Both groups are hungry. The only difference is that we, after sheep in the one group ate straw, we infused directly into their gut a nutrient that they were lacking. And we did this with all kinds of nutrients over time, energy, protein, minerals, vitamins, and so forth. But you'll see how that feedback from the cells and organs with what was put into the gut is changing the liking, the liking for food of these, of these animals. So the one group loves it, the other group can't figure out what's going on. And one of the first studies we did was with energy, because we figured if you can't condition a preference with, with a source of energy, you won't be able to do it. 
And I often think of this quote from Dave Barry when I do that. He says, what are calories? He says, calories are little units that measure how good a particular food tastes. Add the feedback and that's it. He goes on to say, fudge, for example, has a great many calories, whereas celery, which is not really a food at all, but a member of the plywood family provided by Mother Nature so we'd have a way to get onion dip into our mouths at parties, has none. As I say, add the feedback term and that the, the feedback part, and that's exactly what, what we're talking about. So here's where I make a long story very, very short and simply say we worked with energy in a variety of forms, with protein in a variety of forms, with protein to energy ratios as a function of need, for instance, with parasite infections during pregnancy, during lactation. We went on to work with minerals and to show that animals can self-select for different minerals as a function of deficits. And then our colleagues in Australia worked with vitamins like vitamin E. We also worked with these secondary compounds. And at the time, people were thinking that they were, were anti-nutrient kind of things and animals didn't like them. But what we learned is everything depends on the dose. In small doses, animals can form very strong preferences for, for these plants with secondary compounds. And then we went on to, they can be nutrients. They, they are, they can, they can act in so many ways. They, they can get rid of internal parasites, they're antioxidants, they're anti-inflammatory. They have many, many, many health benefits for animals. And they also can, can serve as medicines. Um, there's two ways, as we were showing, that animals can self-medicate. One is therapeutically, that is, if they get sick, they can learn to rectify sicknesses by selecting foods that, that, that help them to get better. They can also uh, medicate prophylactically, that is, preventatively. And, you know, back over during my career, and this could be said for many, many people in wildlife as well. <clears throat> we, we did many studies looking at the botanical and chemical composition of the diets of animals, <clears throat> cattle, sheep, goats, under a whole bunch of conditions. And it was typically the case seasonally that three to five plants would make up the bulk of the diet in any one meal. But animals would often eat 50 to 75 plants, nibble on them during the day. And, you know, we used to mainly focus on the three to five as the bulk of the diet and uh, as that relates to plant community composition. But the more we went along and that I went along, come to realize that this 50 to 75 is just as important. They're eaten in small doses and they're, it's enabling animals to experience this wide range of phytochemicals that I was talking about. And through their many properties of these, these secondary compounds or phytochemicals, antimicrobial, antiparasitic, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, immune boosting, they bolster health and protect animals against diseases and pathogens. So they're not trivial, trivial at all. And that 50 to 75 that they nibble on becomes very, very important for health. All those are best eaten in small doses. So I would say then, you know, soils are, are such an important part of life and such an important topic nowadays. I like to say plants turn dirt into soil and diverse mixtures of plants turn soil into homes, grocery stores, and pharmacies for creatures below, for all creatures below and above ground. Um, and that includes these domestic and wild as well. And here's where I'm going to just say a word or two about about the social cultural part of things. And I wanna make a point that natal experiences affect food and habitat preferences in a broad, broad range of different animal taxa from insects to fish, to birds, to mammals, all the creatures that are there on the screen. And, you know, it's, it becomes the home field advantage and I'm repeat here, knowing what and what not to eat, what's a predator, what's not, where and where not to go in the environment. We talk about the home field advantage in sports. That's absolutely essential in life. And all these creatures from earthworms to insects to fishes to birds and mammals, there's great literatures that I talk about that, that, talk, that show that. So when we started our work, and I was intrigued from the time I was on the ranch and we were moving cattle and seeing all these subgroups of cattle and 
thinking about, you know, where the subgroups hung out and what that might mean. Um, it wasn't hard then when we started research to show that mom has lifelong influence on both diet and habitat selection by her offspring. Uh, these, her influence begins in the womb. You know, the fetal taste system is fully functional during the last trimester of gestation. And so flavors of foods mom's eating are getting into her amnionic fluid. They're also getting into her fat and can serve as cues. Interesting research that's been done with rabbits on, on that uh, during winter when those compounds are being metabolized and the young offspring are getting exposed to them. Uh, flavors of mother's <clears throat> diet in her milk. And then mother is so important as a model of what and what not to eat and where and where not to go after birth. So it was easy for us to show in cattle, sheep and goats, all three, the huge influence that, that mother has on learned abilities. And then that goes to grandmother and great grandmother when you have transgenerational kinds of linkages to landscapes. Uh, I'll just say here that the very same things are true in we human beings. Um, some um, amazing work actually has been done with, with humans on in utero kind of influences, experiences early in life as well. Mother is, is a huge model. Um, so here's where we're gonna break and I'll give you a food for thought question here um, related to diets. There's meant to be a cartoon here. It says, well, well, it seems your weight is just perfect. You just happen to be 11 feet too short. So I want to say here that nobody has to tell a wild insect, fish, bird, or mammal what and what not to eat, to nourish, and self-medicate itself. They know how to do that. When offered diverse mixtures of phytochemically rich plants, locally, locally adapted livestock, um, nourish and self-medicate with any, without any help from nutritionists or toxicologists or, or veterinarians. Now consider the irony. We are told, we humans are told constantly by authorities what and what not to eat to be healthy. Um, with all that advice, you'd think we'd be fit, but the fact is we're horribly unfit. And that, that's globally that that's happened. So the question I'd like you to ponder and talk about here briefly is, do we humans lack the ability to identify and select nourishing diets? Or has that ability been hijacked? And if so, how has that happened? And then how can we reclaim uh, reclaim that, that sort of God-given ability. So with that, I'll stop the, the screen sharing and turn it to, over to you to put people into groups for a chat, and then we can come back and, and we'll dive into that question and uh, topics related to it. We will indeed. Thank you, Fred. Uh, I wonder if, and maybe will you get to, will you talk at all about Clara's kids in the second part of your presentation? No, I don't talk. I don't, but I, we can talk about Clara's kids. <laughs> I don't want to get us that. off off track on our timing, but as we kind of transition from you talking about your research and and studies of um, animal behavior and animal nutrition into these ideas about human nutrition. I wonder if just kind of a brief synopsis of um, Clara's kids would help lead us into that breakout room discussion, if you could. Okay, yes, no, absolutely, absolutely. I love this, this work. It was about a hundred years ago, Clara Davis, this little I'm told petite pediatrician, I would have loved to have, have met her, petite pediatrician in Chicago, did a study with, with 15 children given up for adoption in an orphanage. The children were, um, the study ran for six years. They offered them 34 foods, wholesome foods that were available seasonally. And uh, the, the nurses were told not to give any hint of what those children should, should select or not select. And then six years, every meal those children ate, they documented what, what, they, what they did. And a pediatrician followed their health. A uh, pediatrician published a paper that I've read after that was done. He said he never saw a healthier group of kids. And they were selecting all on their own. And I wish I could, you know, she said it, it, they, 
they didn't they didn't follow at all the advice the pediatrician's advice for the day of what they should be eating they weren't following that meals would be combinations of things that would literally blow your mind a, a breakfast of brains and orange juice maybe <laughs> a supper of of something you'd think for breakfast it was, it was just it was really touching to read but she made points she said here's here's the key no two children ever selected the same mix of foods. No child ever selected the same foods from meal to meal, but every one of those ch children ended up selecting a diet that met their needs. And when they would come into the orphanage with deficiencies like rickets, they would, they would form really strong preferences for foods that helped them to rectify that initially when they were sampling. She said though that the kids never gave any indication that they innately knew they sampled everything the napkins the silverware everything went into their mouths but then each child would start to focus on what was going to meet their needs and that's the same thing if they came into those into there with with deficits they would really quickly start to hone in on something that would rectify the deficit so that's kind of a quick and dirty of clarity Clara Davis is, uh, I, I'll say one other thing, I shouldn't, but I didn't know of Clara's studies when we were doing our studies. It was a person in Canada who wrote a book, Mark Shaxter, I'll visit briefly about Mark. He wrote a, a, a book um, titled um, about, about meat, about uh, steak, one person's quest for quest for the the healthiest piece of meat on the planet or something like that but he he said if you read claire davis's stuff he was reading our work where we were doing feedlot studies and we were either feeding animals a total mixed ration or giving them a choice of the four ingredients that were in that ration and when we were writing up that work we were saying no two cat when given a choice no two calves ever selected the same combination of foods. No calf ever selected the same foods from meal to meal. Yet they all finished in great condition. Every bit as good a condition as the animals on the total mixed ration. But it cost us way less to feed them because they were eating less food. They were eating to meet their needs rather than overeating on that total mixed ration. So that's long-winded, but that's Clara. And that's how we got hooked up with Clara through our work. And it was like we plagiarized her reading what she was writing about those kids and reading what we were writing about calves. It was like, my gosh, it's just we're seeing the same things in livestock that she saw in humans. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for expounding on that, Fred. I think that creates such a great link between, again, the, the ideas that we're talking about in animal nutrition and behavior and our own nutrition and behavior. So thanks for expanding on that. Could you um, tell us the, the question one more time as I, um, if, if you guys have ever been in a breakout room on Zoom before, we're going to kick you into a breakout room. It's going to be a small group of five to seven of you in, in a room together. We're going to be there for 10 minutes. So please take your, um, your, your microphone off mute and turn your video on if you can. I know a lot of us have, have uh, bad rural internet, so um, if video isn't an option, that's okay too. But um, go around the room. You'll have about a minute apiece to say hello, answer the question, and start a dialogue. Now, we're going to have our Rancher Stewardship Alliance board members in room to get the conversation going. But if you get into your room and no one is talking, that means that you are supposed to be the leader of the group. So jump right in, say hello, and start the conversation. So Fred, could you tell us the question one more time and then Angel will put you into the breakout rooms. You bet. Given that wild and domestic animals <clears throat> have the ability to self-select in ways that they can meet their needs for nutrients and self-medicate, Yet humans are constantly being told what we should and shouldn't be eating. We go to the to, to the uh, doctors for for drugs, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do these. But the question is, then you know, do our bodies lack the ability to know what we need to nourish ourselves and self-medicate, or has that been hijacked? And if it has been hijacked, has that ability been hijacked? How how did it get hijacked? How did how did it, do we still have it? but we just don't realize it and we don't know how to have that manifest, I guess. Does that make sense? Yes, it yeah, does. What, what's, happened, what's happened with all that? 
Thank you, Fred. Okay, so Angel, please go ahead. If we could go ahead and send folks into their breakout room. Again, you'll be in there in 10 minutes. You have to accept the invitation to join and then we'll all come back together and share a little bit of a review. Do you guys make your way? As you guys make your way back into the main room, um, go ahead and, uh, and we'd love to hear your, your questions, your comments, or, or kind of key ideas or themes that came out of your breakout room. And that's a good place for us to get started for our Q&A later. For, um, Fred's going to have another portion of presentation now. But again, please um, use the chat box right now as you come back into the main room to let us know what are some big ideas or key themes that you talked about or some commonalities that you found or questions that came out of that um, breakout room. So as we, um, as you guys add those thoughts to the chat box, I'm gonna had it, uh, hand it back over to Fred. Okay, thank you, Laura. And thanks to all of you for, for <clears throat> doing the breakout. It'll be fun to see what, what you're thinking when we, when we get back together. So, Let's move into that food for thought question, actually. And this part three of the book is titled Savoring the Artist's Palette. And as we were saying, going into the breakout, nobody has to tell wild creatures how, <clears throat> how to eat, develop, and replicate. And then we were talking about the irony. People must be told by authorities what and what not to eat. And then that question, have we lost the ability to identify and select nourishing diets or has that ability been hijacked? And, you know, if you think back during the last 10,000 years and prior to that, when our ancestors were hunter-gatherers, they surely must have been, and they were like wild uh, creatures in the sense of knowing um, what and what not to eat seasonally, how to select nourishing diets, how to self-medicate. That, that just, that's an amazing, amazing topic. And how um, people learn to self-medicate, the many different ways they learned that, including from watching wild animals that were sick and so forth. But over time, we transformed from hunter-gatherers um, to farming and ranching, where I still feel, in my own experience, there were deep deep ties with the land still and with plants and animals and so forth, and then moved more and more toward the industrial agricultural and systems that we're in now. And the whole food, food processing systems that, uh, that we're in. And really, when you think about it, and if any of you've lived um, a long time, you, you know that quantity has come to trump quality. And Mark Shaxter talks about that so nicely in this book, The Dorito Effect, The Surprising Truth About Food and Flavor. And as he points out, and as older people like me, I would say, have experienced, we know that the flavors of meat and produce have become blander during our lifetimes. At the same time, processed foods have literally become irresistible. Um, we've thus disincentivized real foods because they don't taste good anymore and we've made junk food all the more desirable. If we want to get into some of the science behind it, we know that the, the nutrition and phytochemical richness has declined from 10 to 50 percent in many, many fruits, vegetables, and grains. Um, and that's as a result of, of three things. One, we've selected varieties for growth as opposed, as opposed to phytochemical richness. The ways that we grow varieties can also, when we irrigate and fertilize, we can also stimulate growth at the expense of phytochemical richness. And then to make matters even worse, with fruits, for instance, and, and some vegetables, we pick, pick them green and ripen them. And we know that that greatly inhibits the phytochemical richness. And then the longer an item is on the grocery store shelf or in transit, they're losing a lot of their nutritional and phytochemical richness. And so all those factors have contributed to, um, to making, it's no wonder that kids don't like, and adults too, don't like fruits and, and vegetables and uh, so forth. It's also happened with meat and dairy. And here I'll just say that um, we know, as I was alluding to, that resource availability in the environment, water, nutrients, and sunlight in influences the plant species that grow on rangelands. 
And that also influences the diversity and chemistry of those species, as I've mentioned as we've gone along. And then the point I want to make is that plant diversity and chemistry in the diets has a huge influence on the biochemical richness of the diets of animals and their health as well. It's affecting their health of goats, sheep, and cattle. And then that's influencing the quality of milk, cheese, and meat. Here's where I'll say we could spend easily an hour or two hours on this topic alone and some of the research, and I'm a cheerleader on some of that research that's looking at how uh, feedlot diets where there's really not any choice, total mixed rations versus uh, diverse diets where animals are out foraging or even diets where animals are giving just a few choices. We're looking at how that influences the health of animals and then the quality of milk, meat, and cheese. And it has a huge influence. I'll just have to leave it at that. We've written many review papers. We've got scientific papers that are coming out on that. And if we ever wanted to sponsor a special session just to talk about that, there's so much to, to that, but it simply shows these, these connections. And it also illustrates how as we've moved away from diverse diets on rangelands and pastures, we've caused the flavor as well as the quality of meat, milk and cheese to go down compared to, to when animals are out foraging on really diverse diets. I'll go from there into this fourth topic that's in the book and it's titled Grappling with Uncertainty. And, um, <clears throat> I want to tie back with what we were talking about earlier, this nutritional wisdom of the body. And I want to make a point that that wisdom occurs at a non-cognitive, intuitive, synthetic level. Um, nobody has to think about which enzymes to release to digest the foods they've eaten in a meal. Nor do we think about our change in liking for the flavors of foods as a function of the, the nutritional quality of the foods. That's happening automatically uh, within the body. So that's a key point. But another point that I wanna make here is that this cognitive, rational, analytical part of us, this, this part that, that would tune in to what authorities tell us, that you should be eating this, you shouldn't be eating the, and Laura, as you and I were talking, you shouldn't be eating so much salt, you should drink so much water, you should be eating this, you shouldn't be eating that. All that influences us, that has a big influence on what we do, and it can override this wisdom of the body that's occurring at this non-cognitive, intuitive, synthetic level. The brain is one of many mutually interdependent organ systems in the body. It thinks it's running the shop, but it's not, but it can override these other systems. And I'm gonna illustrate how that occurs through this very short video here that, that's just an amalgam of all these different things that we're told constantly that we should and should be, shouldn't be doing related to food. We're so happy to have everyone home for the holidays. Your dad has been cooking all day. Butter braids, bacon wrap with my famous apple sage stuffing. Who wants one? None for me, honey. I'm on a diet. And did you say butter braids? Because I'm dairy free. I'm lactose intolerant. I'm gluten free. No stuffing for me, honey. I'm off carbs. I don't eat meat anymore, except for fish and chicken, just not turkey. Is that free range? Did it die of natural causes? Was it an assisted suicide? Because that is the most morally delicious. Nothing for her. She's just difficult. <laughs> Okay, dig in. Let's have butter. Brought to you by Canada's Liquor Corporation. Nothing says Christmas like booze. So they illustrate in less than a minute what it would take me forever to talk about and do it so well. But the key point is that there's all this information that we're getting all the time and it influences us and it can cause us to quit listening to the wisdom of the body and to yield to advice from authorities in ways that, that we're not even aware of. Um, so these kind of experiences can influence what we perceive, how we believe and how we then come to behave. And let me illustrate that just quickly here with, um, with some findings. 
One, and I'm not trying to advocate for any diet when I say this, you know, people need to figure out would be what I'd say, what works for them and try to tap into the wisdom of their own body. But there are studies that show that vegetarians report, while they report a low desire to eat meat compared with, with omnivores, when you look at their neural activity, it reveals an inherent craving for meat, that there, there's a need there, there's a need for meat. And these findings highlight that the, dis the dissidence between acquired beliefs and attitudes and inherent needs for nutrients that are contained in meat. If a person's eaten meat before, the body remembers that. The body remembers what it got from that at cell and organ system level. And then if you quit eating meat and you go on to a vegetarian diet, then that's where these kind of, of neural activities can be revealed. Um, they're also revealed in studies where people tell people things, scientists tell people, for instance, in one study, and this is a key point, they're offering people the very same piece of meat. It's the very same piece of meat. And when meat samples were paired with descriptions of animals raised on factory or humane farms, um, the factory farm samples looked and smelled less pleasant and tasted saltier and greasier to people when they were told that. If they were told that they came from a humane farm, then the opposite occurred. And the key point is it's exactly the same piece of meat. So it's, it's the power of what we come to believe to influence what we perceive and then how we behave. The same is true with gluten. And I'm not saying that people don't have gluten sensitivities. There are people definitely that do. But many people believe they had, have adverse reactions to wheat and gluten when they don't. And that's in, illustrated in studies where people are fed high gluten, low gluten, or no gluten foods. And they have pain, bloating, nausea, and gas to a similar degree, regardless of what they get, indicating these strong kind of nocebo effects that are influenced by what, what these people believe. This example here, it's the last one I'll use, illustrates that this is happening at a physiological level. People often say it's all, well, it's all just in your head and it is, but it's happening at this very, very basic neurophysiological kind of level. There's a hormone, uh, ghrelin, it's called the hunger hormone. It affects appetite and plays a key role in the rate of use and distribution of energy in the body. So it's an important hormone. But what's interesting in these studies is what, what happens when people are told they're offered the same milkshake, has the same amount of calories, but in one case, um, they're told they have an 80 calorie milkshake, another a 620 calorie milkshake, and ghrelin decreases after an 80 calorie milkshake labeled indulgent. Um, <clears throat> Uh, 620 calories, but not after an identical milkshake labeled sensible, 140 calories. I hope that makes sense. I kind of botched what I'm trying to say there, but you get the point. Depending on what they're told, ghrelin is, is changing despite what the calorie content is of, of that milkshake. Um, the last example I'll use here links it with broader kind of, uh, you know, it's, it occurs in all facets of our lives, this think, believe, behave stuff. And that was really came through to me reading this book uh, by Anita Morjani titled Dying to Be Me. And she talks about how the, from the time she was a little girl, girl growing up in Hong Kong, she'd been pushed and pulled in so many different ways by different cultural beliefs. She was raised in a traditional Hindu family. Um, she lived in a Chinese and British society. From her nanny, she learned Chinese customs and beliefs, including Buddhism. Um, while attending British school, she was told she must read the Bible and go to Christian church every Sunday or she was going to hell. So she had these quite contrasting kind of religious beliefs that then influenced her physical being as well. She finally, in her 40s, was diagnosed with lymphoma and she started to study then holistic health in Western and Eastern healing systems. Uh, that didn't work for her though, and so she decided to travel back to India and to follow the healing system known as Ayurveda, where after many months she was healed. She was, she was, uh, she was in good shape. Um, she then returned 
to Hong Kong and the people there, her friends told her how wonderful she looked and they couldn't believe it. And then they asked her, they said, well, you know, what did you, what have you been doing? And when she told them that she had been uh, in India and working with Ayurveda, then they started to express their doubts and started, they were very Western in their ways of how you deal with cancer and how you cure it. And Ayurveda wasn't a way. And so all her old doubts started to creep in again. There's doubts from her early life. So at that point, she started to experiment with traditional Chinese medicine, which is common in Hong Kong, but it conflicts with Ayurveda. So she was further confused in traditional Chinese medicine, you're encouraged to eat meat, especially pork. In Ayurveda, you're encouraged to be a vegetarian. Meat is the worst thing that you can eat. So in the end, what happened, her organ systems failed and she slipped into a coma with death imminent. It was at that point that she experienced a near-death experience and it changed her life. And her, her discussion of that, of her journey from cancer to near-death to true healing is an amazing story. And she says at one point in the book, she had a, said, I had a choice to come back or not. She said, I chose to return when I realized that heaven is a state. It's a state of being that we can be in. It's not a place. She also said at the end of that, she knew she was cured. When she came back, she knew she was cured. And she, the doctors, she told the doctors, I know I'm cured. You run the test, but I'm cured. And she was. And she, she realized it was a complete suspension of all of her previously held beliefs that occurred after her near-death experience. All of these beliefs, doctrines, and dogma that caused her body to heal itself both physically and spiritually. As she said, concrete beliefs keep us locked into the I am this and I am that sort of things. And that brings me to the, the last part of the book and the last some, some a few thoughts from the last, the last section of the book. And it has to do, it builds further on this, I, these ideas of uncertainty and mystery. And I've always liked this quote from G.K. Chesterton. He says, the real trouble with this world of ours is not that it is an unreasonable world, nor even that it is a reasonable one. Calmest kind of trouble is that it is nearly reasonable, but not quite. Life is not an illogicality, it, yet it's a trap for logicians. It looks just a little more mathematical and regular than it is. It exa its exactitude is obvious, but its inexactitude is hidden. Its li wildness lies in wait. And if you think about uncertainty, that's what that is, but it, it, it makes life what it is. It makes life have, have it keeps life incredibly interesting and, and, and wonderful actually in that sense. Our inability, science aside, anything aside, to try to predict the future is inherent in what he was talking about. And I'm thinking here in this slide has to do with, with something that happened at the turn of the century back in 1900. This group asked these some of the smartest people on the planet at that time what they thought would be here in the year 2000. And it was amazing to read what they speculated. These were imaginative, creative people, what they speculated and what was really here. And it couldn't have been more different. They couldn't have been further off. It, it underlies our inability to, to predict what's going to happen. But there was one of the fellows that wouldn't take the bait. He said, the future is a, a fancy land place whose portals I cannot enter. Moving toward it from here, I am charmed with its brilliant facade. What sculptured splendors, porticos, pillars, stature, windows. What is within? As I advance, however, the airy structures recedes. I cannot push beyond its thresholds. Its doors never open. On the other side are silence and mystery. And so, you know, certainly some things day to day are predictable. Here's a little cartoon says, whoa, another bad one. I see your severed head lying quietly in the red stained dirt, a surprised expression still frozen in your lifeless eyes. Next. On the other hand, most of the big things we deal with 
day in, day out, we don't have a clue what's going to come out of that. This one says, the picture's pretty bleak, gentlemen. The world's climates are changing. The mammals are taking over. We all have a brain about the size of a walnut. So I end the book and I move into this, this uh, section on this notion of, of, you know, mystery, of mystery. What will become of Homo sapiens? Will the trials, the many ecological, uh, economic, social, political trials that we're now facing, Will that cause us to awaken before it's too late or will we end up consuming ourselves? Uh, you know, humans are participating in the sixth mass extinction. For the first time in roughly 300,000 years, we could be on the brink of extinction ourselves. Um, we are in a very real sense, seemingly inexorably being consumed by changes we wrought and consequences that nobody foresaw. You know, historically, our tribal nature has served us well, uh, the in-tribe and the out-tribe and so forth and so on. But you think about it now, we're 8 billion people on the rise on one teeny tiny blue orb in the vastness of, 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 of the cosmos. And it seems to me the tribal nature isn't going to work. We're going to have to learn to be one tribe, seems to me, if we're going to make it. At this moment on this planet, the question isn't life, if life will continue in the Garden of Eden, it will certainly, you know, the age of dinosaurs ushered in the age of mammals, the mammals go out, what will come next? That's been ongoing for, for 4.5 billion years. The question seems to me is if Homo sapiens will continue to live in this Garden of Eden, do we want to, to, to continue here in this planet? You know, when I was writing the book and reading about the coming and going of civilizations and the fact that most of them last only 250 years, I came across a lot that was written about Confucius. And you know, as little kids, we used to tease a lot, Confucius say this, Confucius say that. But as I read about what Confucius taught, I was really impressed and amazed. And he made points, societies must become intricately coupled with one another in the natural landscapes that we inhabit. Cultures must tolerate strong checks on human wants, our wants and wants and wants and greed and can, uh, never can have enough. Nations must develop the managerial capacity to sustain these kind of systems. And what you realized is that Confucianism is grounded in the heart-mind interface that expands in concentric circles. They begin with oneself and spread from there to include successively one's family, one's face-to-face -face community, including the natural environment, one's nation, and finally all of humanity. Confucius understood that in shifting the center of life from the self to the family, one transcends selfishness and egoism. Very important. The shift from family to community gets us beyond nepotism. The move from community to nation overcomes parochialism, and the move from nation to embrace all of humanity can, counters ethnocentrism and chauvinistic nationalism. You know, in the book, The World's Religions that Houston Smith wrote, the great book, um, he points out that the Chinese empire lasted under a succession of dynasties for over 2,000 years, a stretch of time that makes the empires of Alexander, Caesar, and Napoleon look ephemeral. If we multiply the number of years the Chinese empire lasted by the number of people it embraced in an average year, roughly one-third of the human population, it emerges as the most impressive social institution that was ever devised. You know, back after World War II, there was a radio program that Edwin R. Morrow hosted from 1951 to 55, and it was titled This I Believe. There was a book that came out of it, The Personal Philosophies of 100 Thoughtful Men and Women. Many, many years ago, it was late at night, probably midnight, I was on my way back from the airport in Salt Lake City to going to Logan, and they were airing some of the the this program, parts of this program, him, his, his starting the program, which was amazing to listen to why he did it. At that time, McCarthyism, communism, the Red Scare was just permeating society. There was a malaise and a, and a fear and an anxiety that had come over 
the people of the United States. And he wanted to give the people a chance to talk, to simply speak up each night. It was no book other than the Bible has ever sold more copies than this, I believe. It was a moving program. And to listen to him introduce that was really good. And then they were playing excerpts from certain people. And they were all very, very moving. And I can see how the program could have a calming effect on the people of this country. Um, and, but there was one that really struck me. And this man got on, he said, listen, I can tell you what I've been taught to believe by my family, my church, my community, my country, uh, and so forth. But he said, in all honesty, uh, I don't know what I believe in the absence of all that I've been taught. And I thought, you know, my goodness, this guy really gets it at his deep level. We've been studying the profound influence of experiences in utero and early in life on goats and sheep and cattle and realizing how what a huge role that plays in what they become. And here he was articulating this same thing. And, you know, it points out we come to identify with our family, community, culture, religion, profession, politics, country, all of the I am this and I am that sort of things. And I'm not saying that that's bad, but I'm saying it to, to get us reflecting in a broader sense that beyond that, that's not what we are. That's a trap briefly inflected in time and space in our very brief visit to Earth change the time and place where we're born, all the I am this and I am that, all that changes. And in a very spiritual sense, it's when we transcend all of that, that we come to I am, to what people would refer to as oneness with God or with being or whatever one wants to call that. I think the challenge is then to sum up, we face in addressing, quote, all these critical issues on earth have little to do with the issues and everything to do with healing the divides of polarize and iron, isolate us. The irony, the huge irony is that working together to transcend the boundaries we create is addressing the really big issues. We're always in the world of polarities. If we come to the world of unity, the world of, of oneness with being, we transcend all of, all of that. And I think Jesus' message of love, that, that's very important. We do that in terms of working together by declaring love, not war, on one another and the landscapes that, that we inhabit. And I'll finish with this. <clears throat> it's a quote that I've often thought about. When you think about the troubles of the world and, and all that's going on nowadays, I often think of this, and he said, you know, when we talk about settling the world's problems, we're barking up the wrong tree. The world is perfect. It's a mess. It's always been a mess. We're not going to change that. Our job is to straighten out our own lives. And if each one of us does that, in fact, we straighten out the, the world. And so I would say we have a choice, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, or love your enemies. Do we want blind, toothless people, or do we want to nurture one another and life on the earth? Well, we can certainly declare war on life, as we've done for eons, uh, and on one another, certainly, and still doing. We could instead declare love on one another through the, thought, through the land, food, heart, and thoughtscapes that, that we inhabit. And with that, I, I'll stop the screen sharing, and I very much appreciate the chance to be here with all of you. And depending on the time and what's what, um, I'm happy to do whatever other folks want to do. Laura, I'll turn it back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Fred. I hope we can all give you a round of applause uh, through our, our virtual screen to say thank you for, for your time this evening. We are going to jump into a Q&A session, um, but I just want to say, you know, again, our, our book club took five months to discuss this book, um, and, and Fred, you just gave us the crash course in about 50 minutes. So bravo, I know that's not easy. And, and I hope you get to take a, take a breath while we go into a Q&A. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks to all of you. Yeah, so, so folks, go ahead and, and start putting your questions in the chat box um, and we'll moderate those over to Fred. I have a couple from the breakout room, but as I, I wanna give you a chance to put those in there, those questions in there, I wanna just read a little excerpt. Um, 
from the the opening chapter of your book, Fred, because I just think that it um, it's such a delightful statement where you say, if you're enchanted by a childlike sense of mystery and wonder, if you're willing to admit that none of us knows much of anything, you may find this book will warm your thoughts and lighten your spirits as you sit wrapped in the glow of an evening sunset. And I just appreciate the lightness of that because there's a lot that you talked about tonight and in the book and in the presentation that can have a lot of heaviness to it, but you do it with lightness and, and you share that there is a solution. So we, we appreciate you very much. That's a lot of fun. So I want to jump into some of these questions. Um, one, uh, uh, maybe an easy one, when will the audiobook version of Nourishment be available? And where and, and what other books um, would you recommend that we read from your library? Yes, good, good questions, both of them. The, uh, as we were talking, Laura, I think probably late summer, the audio book will be ready. We're working away on the narrative. It's, uh, it remains faithful to what is in nourishment, but it's, it also updates some things and, and there's some more reflections, especially on the spiritual part of things. As we were talking, when we talked with the, with the folks, I, I, I don't see a division between the physical and the spiritual. I, I think it's been a real, um, not a good thing to to separate those things and uh, I, I think that those linkages of, of us with with mother earth and and uh, the spiritual part of things is really important and some things happened that I won't go into right now that happened to be some revelations that that uh, it's been really fun to update so so the audiobook probably be out late su late summer early fall mm -hmm. and uh, It'll, it'll remain true to these sections and so forth that, that I covered, but it'll, it'll update in places and, uh, and try the book. The book I know is, um, and I tried hard not to make the book really dense, but I know it is from what people have told me. It's, I tried, I thought, tried my best to make it an easy read, you know, uh, and, uh, but I know there's just a lot, a lot that's in that. And so this audio book is an attempt to, to, to make a kind of a reader's digest version of what's in nourishment too. And then in, in nourishment, you know, there were so many, so many wonderful books that I read over the years, so many, many books. Um, and there's a section in, at the end of the book that just covers so many of those different books that could be posted or, you know, and uh, for me, you, you think when you write something, and we, this came out when we were talking with the book club. You know, I, um, that book was written by a jillion people over time, the honest truth. All the research was in there. That wasn't me. That was all these people I worked with, the relationships, all these things. It's just a way to try to reflect on all of that. And Laura, you did a great job that, you know, that childlike awe and humility. And when I retired from Utah State, I, it was so nice to go back to the backwoods of Colorado where I wrote that book and to think, this is like when I was a child, didn't, didn't need to know anything, didn't have to, just seeing all the plants and the animals and the beauty of nature. And then at night, all those stars and it just put you in awe and, and mm -hmm. you think, yeah, this is a dimension of heaven. We're in it, you know, and it can be hell too, actually, right? <laughs> all that's here. Right. Well, Fred, I want to follow up with a with a comment and a question that Linda left in the in the chat box. And she says, Fred, you're clear eyed about the horrors and the beauties that we live among these days. You maintain such compassion and excitement about how we can transcend the challenges and fear. You say our job is to straighten out ourselves. I wonder if it's not rude to ask what kind of self care you employ to stay so positive. Yes, and I'll be very, I'll be absolutely honest too. It, it can, uh, it can get me down. Uh, you know, so it's just be, being honest. It's like, and when you read the book, you know, I had five years of depression and cancer and different. So, you know, but, and the, what's happening, but I think just, it's just reflecting on what's in that that book and the beauty of nature and really the, the compassion, you know, the compassion, the shared compassion that that we're all sharing this human nature right we're all struggling in one way or another 
And I often think from day to day to just try to say kind things to everybody I see, you know, just be just be nice to them. I don't know what political beliefs they have or what all these division things. So there's that shared that shared humanity in this kind of world of pairs of opposites. But then there's that shared spirituality where we all, we, I very much believe we're all one with the transcendent, with, with whatever we want to call the absolute God being, whatever we call that. There's that shared, that we, we're one with all of that, huh? with one another and with all of that. And, uh, but for sure, you know, there are sad things on this planet. Huh? I, I just think about, um, and then think about all that's going on and, uh, yeah, but then you see people, you know, like when we all know what we see in on Ukraine and then and those people struggling, but boy, the stories that are just so touching that are coming out of there, huh? It's, it can be a lesson for, I, for me anyway, I think that it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful things that, that can be learned from, I just feel so bad for the suffering and I oftentimes think, you know what? Well, how, how do you end up where you do end up? Why, why am I not over there doing, going through all, all of that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, Fred. I want to kind of transition. We have a couple of questions that are more specific questions, and I hope that this will transition us to those. I wonder, you, you made the comment that um, we have this obligation or, or a calling, if you will, to that oneness and that that reflects on the way that we care for the world around us right and most more specifically for this audience for for those of us who care who, whose job and calling some might call it to care for land and livestock how does that self-awareness or that um that internal introspective experience translate to the way that we care for land and livestock and do the more tactical things that we do in our day-to-day -day lives. Oh, I see it as such a direct link, you know, and I've come to feel very much that all life is sacred. How we get into fights over, should you eat plant, only plants or should you not eat meat and all those things, but plants are conscious and sentient and you come to I very much feel, you know, all life is sacred. And people who work with animals and plants and the land, you know, that's a beautiful thing. I, those years I spent on the ranch for me were everything I've done. And I never, you know, I wasn't born and raised on a ranch. It was almost quote chance like, I don't believe that, but that I ended up out on that ranch with Henry DeLuca. But that was such a moving, moving, you know, we worked so closely growing plants where we, you know, we didn't, it was, uh, in those, I date myself a little bit, it, it was all done by hand. We hauled hay by hand. We, we irrigated the grain up by hand. You'd be, and so much time to just sit and reflect out there and grow, you know, breaking those little ditches we'd put in, irrigating the grain, harvesting the grain, harvesting, working with the, with the, with the animals, and then butchering in the fall. And all that, to me, was so incredibly grounding and centering. I think it's a beautiful life. And what I feel is a sad thing is that as a peoples in, in the US, what less than 2% of the people are farm or, or ranch, we've lost that connection with, with the planet. So I often when I give talks, I say, well, we should all be growing gardens, herbal, vegetable, medicinal gardens, grow you some chickens like the old people used to where I grew up. They all did that. And, you know, we're not supposed to have chickens where we are right now. It's a long story, but to cut to the, we, we built them a really nice place, a chicken palace. And in the, when, <clears throat> through a lot of the year, we'll turn them out each day. And we'll have people that come from the city um, and they'll be here when we do it. And it's amazing to see, they say, it's so amazing. It's just so calming to be out here with these, you know, it's quote, just a bunch of chickens roaming around doing what chickens and ducks do. But it, might, it gives me hope because it makes me think, you know, there's something in us that just links in with that huh? and that, mm -hmm. What a sacred thing all of that is. The, the, you know, it's not that a person's quote just a farmer or just a rancher or just that. Those, those are such they're foundational to everything. And we seems like to me we all need to be 
farmers and ranchers uh, get rid of all the grass for one thing, all the lawns, all the manicured lawns that were putting so much money into water, fertilizer, um, gas to mow them and start to grow native plants and grow gardens, you know, do that, get you all become farmers again in a way. I, I, I think that's, then that links you then to me anyway, physically and then spiritually, because you start to, you appreciate that. That's all, it's all part of the oneness as well. For me anyway, you know, I it's very deeply linked with that. And I think that's the beauty of being on farms and ranches, huh? That That's, that's a that's a gift uh, even though i know it's a lot of challenge with that and economically and socially and all that it's part of the part of the game but it's uh that's that's a wonderful thing it's a wonderful thing just makes me think so many things that henry de lucas said over the years when i was out there and i won't it would be fun to get into that but i know we're short on time <laughs> Fred, one of the things I appreciate about you so much is that you you combine the the spiritual and the scientific in in beautiful ways. So I want to move us a little more and and answer a couple of these scientific questions before we close tonight because I think there's specific questions that folks are curious about. Um, one that came out of the after the breakout room, someone asked, "Are the cravings of pregnant women examples of self medicating?" Um, and I guess I would want to build on that question a little bit to then ask. Um, um, and if so, and how so, and what effect does that have on the offspring or, or the fetus and then the children? Yes, that's an amazingly good question. And so interesting there, you know, those cravings are related to, to nutrients. They also can be related to self-medicating and they could prepare a fetus actually to know something that it needs if it gets I talk about that a little bit in the book where I got mom, I hated chili my whole life. And then I got mumps and I had this incredible craving for chili. Well, there was things that my body knew were in chili that it needed. So those, you know, those things link. And I, I it's been a while, but I'm pretty sure I put in, nour in nourishment some of those, you know, where there was a case where a lady would drive, she was a professor and she drove hundreds of miles on the weekends. She got pregnant and drove hundreds of miles and she would just eat clay where she grew up. She would eat the clay that was along the riverbank and it was embarrassing to her. You know, it's like, what the heck is going on? Well, it's as a young child growing up, her body had learned about the nutrients in that and her body was needing those. And so she would package it up. She'd take it home with her. So very much that. And morning sickness also is linked in with that. The fetus is very susceptible to toxins and young children are very susceptible to toxins. And that morning sickness is a way that, that it can protect the fetus. There's a literature out there that's really interesting on humans on, on that too. So the long and short is that, that that's meaningful. And then you know, this whole thing that the fetal taste system's fully functional during the last trimester of gestation, the fetus is learning, learning, learning about what mother's eating and then milk and so forth. So yeah, those linkages start, start, uh, start in the womb and then epigenetically they can go back to grandma and great grandma. And so it just gets you realizing how linked, you know, uh, what's an individual, you start to wonder what even is this thing I call me in that sense. So I, I want to, the next question I have connects there to the epigenetic question. And, and Patty asks, how can we overcome the epigenetic effects that we're facing today with all the standard American, with the standard American diet and our future health for humans? Yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> and the beauty of epigenetics is that genes genes can change, right? That th those genes that are switched on can be switched off and vice versa. And so I think the key thing is to, is to move toward wholesome diets, to move toward wholesome plant and animal kind of diets, get off all, you know, this is briefly, there's so much ins and outs and nuance. And that's where, you know, we put ourselves in such a pickle that, that, that knowledge that, that people have of what we've done to ourselves becomes valuable, actually. So, you know, 
but um, trying to get back onto wholesome diets, uh, plant and animal foods, and get all the, the ultra processed foods out of our diets is a way then to start to switch that, that, that genome back. There's an example I give in nourishment of those studies that Randy Jurdle did with genistine, this secondary compound, and <clears throat> supplementing obese female rats that were obese and, and in poor health. And he supplemented with them with during pregnancy, their, their, their offspring were born with a different Coke Kohler and they weren't obese. And I don't know if you remember that, but it's, it's those kind of things that say, but mom's going to have to change, right? And it's important to change uh, during pregnancy to really put your diet into a good one because that can then switch on and off genes that you want. But his study with those, those rats just so illustrated that point. Here you have these obese, really unhealthy female rats, sub supplements them with this phytochemical genistine during pregnancy. Their offspring are born skinny, normal, uh, none of the issues compared to the the other control rats that were, <clears throat> were not supplemented. So, you know, diet matters a lot and diet and exercise and all those things that we, we do get told that do matter. <laughs> and that's a way, that's a way to do that, you know, and then make that become a part of the, of the start that one generation, you know, one, one child, one generation at a time to become part of the, of the culture again, huh? of the food culture. Yeah, and it's amazing how long lasting those in impacts can be. Another thing I'd underline here is that um, famine experienced by mothers cause epigenetic changes passed on to the next two generations. So it is just amazing to think that the decisions that we make today in our bodies and with what we eat are affecting the lives and, and genetics of, of future generations, multiple future generations. Absolutely. And then to realize that by participating, we're helping to change that time and that, that yeah. we can do things and we're not, we're not, <clears throat> genes aren't, aren't, we're not machines and genes aren't destiny in that sense, right? We can, mm -hmm. we can do things, which is empowering. Huh? It's empowering. It is right, and and Monica in the chat box says yes, and I'm thinking about calf weights in it on that same thread of of thinking of of what's going on with our animals as they're experiencing drought conditions right now, and and what does that look like in generations to come in our cow herds? Yeah, that's absolutely right, and that's that's taking that's taking that idea and making it real in that sense, right? We right. did studies too where we were looking at. Not so much the drought and the way that is, but winter forages and poor quality forages. And if a young calf gets exposed in utero uh, to mom eating those, you know, wintering out, wintering out on those forages. And we showed the calf after birth, when it's exposed to those forages, they eat more of them, they can digest them better. And so there's those kind of influences that are being manifest. And uh, yeah, absolutely the case. Uh, it's, it's, Keeps you thinking, huh, about all the dynamics of this stuff and that that it's ongoing, huh? It's on it's ongoing. Right. So earlier you mentioned a study where you took um, total mixed rations and then segmented them out and, and let the animals self-select those um, food sources. And one of the questions in the chat box was um, asking about what about total mixed mineral mixes? Wouldn't it be better to offer our animals a la carte minerals so that they can select what they need? Yes, that's that same idea. And in the book, I talk about Doc Holliday, um, a holistic vet, not the one at, at OK Corral. But <laughs> I'm old, but not that old. But, you know, and he gives a fabulous example of, <clears throat> of, of some dairy, dairy uh, first calf heifers that were, were aborting calves and they were eating over two pounds per day of a mixed mineral block, huge amount of block. And so the, the client he was working with, Carl, decided that he would try this cafeteria a la carte uh, choice for those animals. And, uh, you know, he, he was putting it out, the free choice of these different minerals. And uh, then one of the times he's walking through the lot, he's Doc is describing this and he says the calves, these docile calves sur surrounded him, tore the bag out of his arms, 
ripped it open, ate every bit of it, and even the, what fell in the mud and muck, he said, what was in the bag? Source of the trace mineral zinc. And they were really deficient in zinc. And over the next, over the next week to two weeks, um, they, they finally quit eating so much of the zinc. All the calving problems went away. They were aborting live calves. All the calving problems went away. And so he goes on to talk. And then he, it's in a chapter in a book that he wrote um, about, uh, it's a wonderful book, but um, about the nutritional wisdom of animals. We, he got in touch with me many, many years ago we, we, he, when he learned about the work we were doing. And so that idea relates. You know, one of the things I've often said, and we showed that animals can self-select. We, we did that with different minerals. And that they learn, they learn to rectify different deficits um, for different minerals, phosphorus, calcium, sodium, and so on. And one of the things I used to tell people, because it can be expensive to, to offer free choice, was that we used, what we used to do was to think about what minerals are likely to, to be deficient in our area. Where I was there in northern Utah, uh, copper and uh, copper and selenium were ones that, that we could have problems with. And so, so you know, you could offer a... Uh, uh, a composite mineral block, but then you could offer those free choice so that if animals need more, they can, can get that. So we used to think about how, when we were interacting with people, how might you be able to tailor that in ways that are economical. I've had so many letters that I've received from producers over the years, it's been amazing, of them telling me stories of their experiences with um, when they got into cafeteria mineral supplements and how much selection would change as they went from season to season and from pasture to pasture, how animals would really, really reflect that. And uh, it was just, yeah, I just, you know, I absolutely believe what they're, they're telling me and their observations, that's uh, critical. Another one that they've told me, this is a little aside, but I can't help as I've been told this for ever since Clinton and Gore were in, were in, in, in office. And the first time I ever heard it was, was a story of a rancher who was, was at a, at a, uh, at a top that Al Gore was talking, where he was touting the importance of GM foods and how that was going to be the way and talking about GM corn. And I'm not trying to make so much, well, I talk about it in the book, but the point that this guy, you know, he was talking about how, um, cattle and corn for cattle and stuff. And this, this rancher at the back of the room, when he finished the talk, he raised his hand kind of sheepishly. And he says, you know, Mr. Vice President, my cattle haven't heard what you're talking about because they do not like GM corn. And I've received many, many letters from people <clears throat> that talk about when wildlife as well as domestic stock have a choice on their places between GM corn in this case and non-GM corn, they strongly prefer the non-GM corn. And I get into some of that, what, you know, what is that? What's going on and why might that happen? And get into it a bit in the book. But I was reminded of it recently where I got another letter from a guy who's talking about mule deer and cattle. And he was talking about that choice. And it's, uh, well, if you learn what, how GM works, some of those varieties, you understand it becomes a kind of a toxin and it's a no wonder they don't want it. You know, anyway, that's get it, moving aside, but it's that choice and ability to choose and uh, that, that can be important in minerals, going back to the question, you know, but also it's being expressed in a lot of ways by animals and be, being good observers, some huh? people who love to be out in the land and love to be with, with plants and animals and just are fascinated by that. You, you pick all that up and it points out that there's many ways to know. Huh? Science is one way that we can learn about things, but the observations and the importance of observations and thinking about things, hugely powerful way to learn that it got discounted a bit with all the science stuff over the years, but shouldn't be discounted, you know? Shouldn't be, when I was on the ranch, Henry didn't have any education at all, formal, but he had a lifetime of, you know, 70 some years when I got out there of experience of being out there. He knew, he knew a tremendous amount that has to be given huge credit. Yeah.
So I digress all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's that's I, Fred. I just think that's such a wonderful place for us to end this evening. Um, I I think that one of the things that was a reoccurring theme in our book club discussions was just the power of observation and how reading your book and reflecting on some of the research that you've shared um, made us all stop and pause and be um, more thoughtful and observant of the world around us to say, oh, I have noticed those cattle go here, or they responded like this, or they did this, and I always thought that was strange, but I didn't wonder why. And so just the, the power of observation is, um, is, I think, something that I think is a, a good place for us to end here and to just say thank you for sharing your observations and your time and your expertise and, and empowering us to be more um, thoughtful and observant in our lives and our world around us as well. So thank you, Fred. Yeah, and thanks to every one of you for taking the time to, to come this evening, you know, so meaningful to me, uh, all stolen moments at this point in the game, huh? Older we get, the more, more we appreciate all of that. So, and thanks to you, uh, Laura, for doing such a great job moderating and, and Rick to, for you getting this all set up back when and Angel for being behind the scenes and then to every one of, every one of you for, uh, for participating, just wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, we appreciate you and know we're all giving you a big round of applause again through the Zoom screen. So we appreciate you so much. Um, folks, we are going to put a link in the chat box for a, um, a feedback survey, and we do appreciate those responses. We use those to mold our next um, webinars and, and think of new speakers and topics. And so Angel's putting a link to that in there right now. She's also going to put some links to um, one to purchase the book Nourishment. If you haven't gotten a copy of that yet, we'll have a link to that and some contact informa information for Fred um, if you'd like to reach out to him and, and learn more or ask other questions. So um, Fred, is there anything that we've missed this evening that we should close with or share? No, I think that's a wonderful way, as you said, the power of observation and curiosity, huh? Never lose a holy curiosity about an awe and wonder at this whole, you know, at this brief visit we get to this planet, even with all its horrors, beauties, wonders, deep mysteries, huh? Amen. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Fred. Thank you to all of you who joined us this evening. Thanks for taking time to invest in, in learning and growing and being a part of our Ranchers uh, Stewardship Alliance community. We just appreciate you and we appreciate this time together. So um, with that, we will sign off. I'll leave this room open for a little bit if you're grabbing links out of the chat box, but we appreciate you and uh, hope you have a good evening.